so I want to tell you something. I, I've been speaking publicly for probably about the last 10 years, and um, I teach all the time. But, and, and last week, I actually delivered a six-hour lecture. Preparing an 18-minute presentation was like the most challenging thing I've ever done. And here's the reason. Because this is the first time I'm publicly speaking about myself. I always present information. I speak about my work. I highlight other people. But here it is. I'm finally taking the opportunity to be vulnerable and to um, all in the name of helping you to be able to find your balance and to find your own ability to make change. Sounds good? All right, so let's start here. Babies are balanced. <laughs> so that's a photo of me around the time I was nine, nine months old in Uganda. And it, you know, and life was really simple then, as, as, it, as it is for a lot of babies who are well cared for. I had a very loving mom. And basically my life was imbalanced, you know, unless I either was wet, hungry, tired, or, you know, maybe just feeling a little bit vulnerable. So what happens? It was really easy to fix that. My mother would just come and change me, feed me, give me a big hug, um, and, uh, you know, big dimples were coming out. That's, that's kind of how it worked out. Well, fast forward, you know, and actually what, ha what ended up happening is that as a result of having that kind of balance, I ended up being able to walk and talk and do all those great things. If you think as a baby, you're, you know, really vulnerable, you can't move, you can't do anything, but that's what it requires for you to take those big leaps. Well, for me, 40 years later, um, you know, lots of accomplishments, lots of things going amazingly um, on, uh, in my life, and on the surface, I had a wonderful life. But, you know, it's like it became really, really apparent to me around September of last year that things were really horribly out of balance in my life. And I was really active, and I had a lot going on. But here's the thing. You know, when I was in those quiet moments, I said, okay, well, maybe it's just because I'm this, like, harried entrepreneur. I'm always on the go. I'm traveling. Blah, blah, blah. But then when I really kind of sat down and I listened to myself, I said, no, it's actually a, bit, a lot deeper than that. There's a lot more going on. And what I faced, and I had to really face that for myself, is that, you know, I'd gone through a pretty horrible, um, I'd been married and, you know, and divorce is pretty horrible. I'd lost my dad fairly suddenly to cancer. Um, and I'd also, you know, 2009, I went from 2008, December to 2009, you know, feeling like my, my business was just at the peak. And then I lost 60% of my business as a result of the economic downturn. So a lot of things had happened that I really hadn't processed. I just kept working through. And it just, it just kind of finally hit a wall. But on the other side of that was also the, the, the realization that, you know, while I would love the work that I do, and I've impacted a lot of nonprofit organizations and really helped them to um, move their missions forward, I realized there was a lot more going on there. And I remembered when I, when I was a little girl, my mom told me that, you know, People always come to you for advice. Like I was always the one that you know kids would call for advice or whatever, and and then if you kind of move forward um, to recently, I've you know I've been an entrepreneur in residence at the hotel school, and so I spend time with the students, helping them with their businesses and whatever it is that they're trying to do. In fact, one of them, Kira West, is an awesome young lady. Um, I was just here earlier, and, and I have had an opportunity to help her. But anyway. So the point was that I knew that there was something bigger, and I knew that it really wasn't about me moving forward in the way that my business is. It was really about finally taking everything that I'm doing, what people naturally come to me for, the advice and motivation, all that, to kind of package that and do, you know, create a business around that, helping them to be able to affect their own change. And so, you know, I said, okay, how am I going to make this happen? What am I going to do? And I did my normal things, you know, the motivational books. I went to church, I did this, I didn't, like nothing was working. I talked to my mom, I talked to my family. And finally, I remembered that when I turned 40 three years ago, I actually decided to go spend my birthday at an ashram, which is, you know, a lot of people are like, why don't you have a party? It's fun. You have this big... And I was like, that's actually not where I'm at right now. I, mean, I wanted a little bit more peace, not even realizing what was... I was kind of setting this up for, for this past summer. And, and I remember just feeling so great when I was there, you know, the long weekend. And so what did I do? I went on Facebook to their, to their uh, Shivananda Yoga Ranches, um, page and found that they actually had an opening for someone to come and work with them in their permaculture program um, for three months. Sounds easy, right? Sounds like not a big deal, but here's the thing, like she mentioned earlier, I'm, you know, I'm the, I actually killed my professor's pants when I was a student. Okay? <laughs> so he left me, he went on sabbatical, he left me in charge. He said, one thing you need to do is just take care of my plants. And they died. And so Professor Cullen to this day refers to me as a plant killer. So for me to even sign up for something like this, was kind of crazy, but the whole point was to stretch myself, also have an authentic experience that I'd be able to share with other people. Okay? So here we go. I had to commit to making really three big adjustments in my life. 
this is what I used to think of food, right? So this is kind of, I love meat, and you know, I'm, I'm East African, we eat a lot of meat. Um, and this is actually a photograph of my first meal at the ashram. So I had to commit to being able to eat this, and I actually started to really enjoy it. At the beginning I was really hungry, but I really did enjoy it. I left my home, this is my home. Um, in fact, my home is on the, on the market, hopefully it's closing very soon. And I bought this tent. But I had a bed in the tent, so it you know, wasn't, you know, I'm a hotel, you can't get really that, you know, I needed to have a little bit of luxury and comfort going on. And this was my tent, and I started to really love it, but the point was I really needed to come out of my comfort zone. To that, up until that point, a tent to me was a place where you'd have a big gallop, or you'd go and have fun. It was not a place where you live. I spent a lot of my time working when being around people. Do you all know who this is? This is Chuck Feeney, right? Someone said, a fellow hotelie and uh, one of uh, Cornell's most generous uh, donors. So I spent a lot of time in my work with those kinds of people. Well, I had to commit to being able to do this, right? So that's not that glamorous, but it's what I committed to doing. And, and I, you see, I have a big Kool-Aid smile. I'm excited about it. So I, I didn't have to do I can't say I was the best person because I wasn't really the strongest, but at least I, you know, I had spirit. So that's what would happen. And while I was there, um, you know, when, when I got to the ashram, no, as I was preparing to go to the ashram, I had a conversation with um, a woman who I think is just amazing. Her name is Cheryl T uh, Hillier Tucker. She's a fellow President's Council of Cornell Women member and also a Cornell trustee. And we, we talked and I told her I was doing this. And she was probably one of the only people who didn't think I'd lost my mind <laughs> committing to do this. And she says to me, she's like, Liz, go and have the experience. Stop trying to like micromanage the whole thing. Don't feel like you've got to like figure out the whole 12 weeks and that you're going to come up with all this. She's like, just experience it, just open yourself up. And an amazing thing happened. I actually learned a thing or two, or three, and I'm gonna share that with you. And I had to adjust myself, so here's what happened. I learned about yoga, right? So now, a lot of people know about yoga, sort of the, the postures and the, and the poses and, and all that, but there's this whole philosophy, a 2,500-year-old philosophy around it, which essentially is designed to enable you to, to, to obtain balance within your body, mind, and soul. You know, imagine that. So I thought I was going to come up and create my own philosophy, and here it was. I was, this was sitting um, right under my nose, and it's so simple that kids actually are taught this. These are the photos that I have are from the um, summer camp that they have at the Asha. And so I learned just from doing that, you know, I, I became a vegetarian, I started doing this yoga, um, and I started to really, you know, kind of speak, feel what was going on inside of me. My heart opened, like I really, connected with my inner self. And you know, and it sounds a little hokey to some of those of you who may not um, kind of buy into this, but for me it was a really profound experience and it, and it enabled me to really get back to that, that, that time when I was a little girl and I was a baby and I was happy and I was, you know, just I had genuine joy in my life. But so through yoga I found that balance. Another thing that happened, see this is another one, this is when we're building an herb spiral. This is my, one of my projects, very proud. And um, so while I was at the ashram, I mentioned I was part of the permaculture program. Do we all know what permaculture is? Because I feel like with Cornell people, they know this stuff, right? So basically for me, um, permaculture is sort of a, um, a, a system or yeah, a system where you design, where you kind of look at designing life and designing uh, your communities, taking into consideration at the very essence, the needs of people in balance with those of our planet and, in the, and, in, and frankly, even a those of the, the animals around us, and so that you're creating a harmonious environment for everyone to coexist, right? Of course, we, unfortunately, have not been very good stewards of the earth. I'm not here to have a political discussion, but we haven't. And so learning this it really kind of helped me to not only just find balance with myself through yoga, but I also found balance in terms of how I, I coexist with the rest of the world. And that's really quite profound because I actually took the time to stop see, experience, and even walk around without my shoes, which is really a big thing. I walked around in the, in the, in the grass without my shoes. But, so the permaculture taught me another thing about balance, and it was really quite profound. While I was doing this, I was, I was trying to kind of like blend in. I didn't want anyone to know what I do for a living. And so I was sort of like, oh, you know, I'm a teacher. Or, you know, I just kind of didn't tell them. And somehow someone discovered that I have marketing and fundraising skills. Gosh. So what ended up happening is the ashram is actually over, has been for the last 30, uh, 20, 10 years embarking on a, on a program to become completely sustainable. And so it's done so through a number of different initiatives, the latest of which was a solar power project that they wanted to launch but hadn't been able to do so. So guess who they asked? 
the person who's trying to just, you know, garden and weed and, and, and stuff. But you know what? I fully embraced it because I realized, I said, you know, I'm here to, you know, what better gift can I give as a karma yogi, as a, as a volunteer, than what I actually know how to do? I wasn't really good, like I mentioned, with the permaculture, with the gardening, but I knew I could really help him with this. It was amazing, and it was really, uh, I learned so much about sustainable living and, and all of those things. And so that's the plan for the, uh, where we're going to have the solar panels, and we're going to actually have cover, carports that are, um, a covered carport to protect the cars. And then, you know, I learned a little bit about food and water security and actually how you can grow your own food and looking at how they, the ashram could then uh, begin to uh, engage with the local community more. And so we met with the local farmers. I started getting excited about things like composting, which I've never even thought about. <laughs> um, and, you know, and so it was really exciting. I did, I did a lot of mulching with newspapers. I actually went to the newspaper dump, to, uh, dump to the to the local dump to pick up newspapers, recycling. I was really in there. I didn't get in the dumpster. The other woman did, but I was there. And then finally, the third thing I learned that was really important, I had really become very disconnected from, was engaging in conversations and connections with people. See, I had spent so much time being a human doing, I'd forgotten what it's like to be a human being. And so I finally started talking to people without having an agenda. As, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, I'm always thinking about my business. How can I further my mission, what I'm working on, whatever. So every conversation really has been about what can you do for me? What can I do for you? How can we move forward? But I finally started talking to people and just saying, like, you know, I'm just Liz. This is who I am, being vulnerable, not afraid to cry, doing whatever I need, you know, just kind of connecting, engaging, relating, right? That's what relationships are about, is just relating. And I opened myself up to that. And it was phenomenal. I mean, it was... It was humbling because for once I didn't have to worry about, well, do I sound right? Am I positioned right? Am I looking okay? I was looking a lot really crazy while I was at the ashram, but I didn't really care because it wasn't about that. Um, and these, and I met the most eclectic group of people who taught me a lot about just being a person. And, and it was really, really phenomenal, you know? I feel like I'm going to cry. So you're saying, okay, great. So you had these experiences. You did all this. You lived in the tent. Um, and, and stuff. What is that really, what is that to do with anything, right? What is it? Well, I mean, it's helping me, and I didn't tell you what it is I'm trying to actually accomplish. For me, knowing that um, I've been blessed with the, the, despite the fact that I'm an African woman who was born in Africa, I grew up here, right? So I've had all these experiences where I'm kind of like a cultural bridge figure, right? I'm someone who has the ability to kind of go between different worlds. And I also am someone who has some experience and, and, and so on and so forth, and I really do care about other people, despite the fact that I was disconnected before. <laughs> but, um, and so for me, I felt um, five, going back in uh, 2009, a friend of mine gifted me with a ticket to go to Tony Robbins and Lucia Power with him. And I had been reading his books and the whole thing for lots of years. And I remember lying down in a, in a it's a convention center, but I gotta tell you, it's like a, it's really kind of like a warehouse. <laughs> And we're all lying down in like a concrete floor, 3,000 of my closest friends. And we're listening to Tony, we're in the dark, and you know, and I'm going, I hope a rat doesn't like run by me. But, um, and in that, during that, that, that session, he had us envision what our life would be like in five years if we kept out going down this, the current path. And for me, I can tell you, I couldn't even see beyond five years because I was, like I told you, I was in the middle of my, you know, the whole divorce thing, my dad, and so, I couldn't even imagine, but then I, he had us then envision what our lives would be like if we had the ideal life. And, my, the, and the vision I had was being able to speak to people, being able to inspire people, being able to, you know, really kind of affect change and being the embodiment of that change in other people's lives. And so I wanted to, and I took little baby steps, but it really wasn't until I put myself out and I went and lived in this ashram and I, you know, even fought with the bears, sort of, <laughs> and the coyotes, that I actually, you know, started to fulfill that vision and that mission. And so here's what happened that I can tell you blew my mind. And the first thing is I let, I, hear, I hope you can all see. I get this letter from this woman named Anka Wessels, and I'm like, who is this woman, you know? Yes, that there is email at the ashram. I know people are like, wait, I thought, I, Ben actually sent me a message. He's like, how is it that you're on the grid? I thought you were in an ashram. Anyway, so I get this email, it says, and I'm just highlighting, it says, you know, we want you to explore how social entrepreneurs are creating inclusive, just, and socially, and, social, and sustainable communities, right? And I'm going, 
wait, I just hung out in this ashram. I just did this permaculture. And in fact, I was in the middle of a permaculture design course, certified. And, um, and I was like, wow, this is, I'm actually on the right path. This is a confirmation that I'm doing the right thing. The other thing is that they wanted us to be able to provide cha young change makers with these inspiring role models, clearly consistent with what it is that I'm aiming to do. So I was like, okay, so that's the first confirmation. The second whoop, confirmation happened when um, I spent, when I, after I left the ashram, I traveled to South, South Africa the beginning of last month. And I spent two weeks there speaking in a number of different forums. The last, the tail end of which was spent, um, four days spent with the most incredible young people I've ever met um, at the African Leadership Academy. And if you, I'm gonna say it again because I really want you to look this school up. It's the African Leadership Academy. And it's not Oprah's Academy, it's African Leadership Academy. And what it is, is it's basically a, a school where kids from all over the continent are recruited to, um, to, to spend the last two years of high school. And these are the top kids. They're not, they're not just academically gifted. In fact, it's harder to get into uh, this school than some of the Ivy Leagues. That's how hard this school is to get into. But they've also done something really terrific. I met a young woman who grew up in a, in a refugee camp in Uganda. Uh, she's originally from Dem De Democratic Republic of Congo. And she told me about how she saw a need for a school. And so she, she's 16 and she, created, and she started a school. I met another woman who had started um, a public library because they closed the public library where she's from in Abidjan, uh, in Ivory Coast. And I thought, when I was 16, I really don't think I was thinking about this stuff. But I was so inspired because these are the, because what's the bigger, visit, the bigger vision of the African Leadership Academy is to really pr uh, provide the students with a grounding that will enable them to be the ethical and really amazing and entrepreneurial leaders, uh, future leaders of the continent. And that's what we need, right? And so here I am, I'm with these young people, and I'm going, wow, someone's actually speaking to me. Someone's confirming everything I'm saying. And I want to tell you something else, too. There are three young men right here. Guys, can you stand up? Stephen, Ebenezer, and um, Dawit, who are actually alums of the African Leadership Academy. And I want you to make sure that at, during the reception, you have an opportunity to speak with them and to meet with them, because these, this is the future face of Africa, despite what you've been told about Africa. This is, these are the extraordinary young men that I'm so proud of and so excited about. <laughs> So I spent, you know, four days with these, you know, amazing kids. And then on top of that, I was in my room one night and I, I came across their leadership curriculum. And so this is a, a, a page from their leadership uh, development page, uh, uh, site. And at the very core of the, what they're teaching these students is that you have to basically find balance within yourself. Here are these 16 year olds are learning this. It took me 43 years to figure it out. They're learning that in order for you to be able to affect change, to be able to really do something extraordinary, you must have that balance. You must be hydrated. All the things, you know, the basic things I learned while I was there. And I was so proud because here it is that we're giving these young people who are going to leave the continent I'm from these tools to be able to be effective. And so, again, a confirmation that I was doing the right thing and I was on the right path. Oops. They reversed my slides, sorry. The last thing, the third thing is, um, so I, you know, I, I, I um, teach at NYU, in the Hyman Center for Philanthropy and Fundraising. It's like one of my 50 million things that I do. And so for the most part, I speak, I help nonprofit organizations with figuring out how to brand themselves online and so on and so forth. And, um, and I do, and I also help them on the continent. And I hadn't really spoken that much about it, at NYU in the past because I was sort of like, let me just, you know, blend in and do, you know, kind of go with their agenda. But when I went to South Africa, something happened. I was like, I want to tell them about my experience. And so I, I told them about my experience at NYU and they said, okay, well, why don't you write a piece? I wrote a piece about it. And then they said like, you know what? We're going to create an event around you. So they created an event around me and I was able to tell a different side of the story. See where this is going, right? Changing the narratives, showing a different side. And I was blown away for a number of different reasons. One, we had five days to market it and it sold out right away. That's the first thing. The second thing is um, I then uh, was able to put on SlideShare. Those of you who do presentations probably know SlideShare, whereby um, I always put my slides there. I have like 40 of them up. And I, you know, usually I get like 100 and something hits. I mean, it's like not tons of hits, right? 
I had got almost 4,000 hits within five, within five days of this presentation being up. And that's simply because I had the courage and I felt confident and I was able to activate that network that I've been really creating for a long time that I've been giving to, but haven't really been reaching to get back, you know, that balance that I need. I actually went out and I said, hey guys, I need you to support me in this, this is important. And so it was like just amazing, it just confirmed that, you know, I'm really on the right path and I'm, I'm just thrilled, you know? How do you guys feel? Coming to Africa with me? <laughs> okay, so now, now that we've done that, <clears throat> it's time for you to take a little action, assuming that you've been receptive to what I have shared with you. And I'm speaking to two specific people right now. If you're someone who has that burning desire, that world-changing idea, that special something that you want to do, but you just don't have that balance, you're really trying to move forward with something, I want you to think about the three things you need to do to be able to obtain that balance, to get those, to get that, um, to be able to do what you want to accomplish. On the flip side, if you're somebody who's already created a world-changing initiative, like the young people I, um, we've heard from today, I want you to tell, think about the three things you actually did to create that balance, because you did have to have balance in order to uh, get to that point. And then I'm going to ask you to do something for me, and that's also going to do something for you. I want you to, to get in touch with me, share your stories with me. Let's figure out how we can crowdsource this kind of you know, inspiration together and figuring out how not only to just help yourselves, but also to help others in our community. Sounds good? Okay, so I know I'm, com I'm not sure how far, I'm, I'm at the tail end of my speak, but speech, but I, you know, if there's nothing else that you remember from today, and I hope you do remember a lot, but if there's nothing else that you remember from my talk today, this is what I want you to remember. And I thank you for allowing me to open my heart to you. Um, this has been such an extraordinary experience and I hope that um, I see you making a lot of change and I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.